gonna be weird. This is a weird, we're using this recorded streaming, so there is a very big delay, um, which is fine. So I want to get right into the video because we wanna hear from Michael Conley, Matt Coyle, and interviewed by Naomi. And so to briefly introduce the authors, Matt is the author of the best-selling Rick Cahill crime series. Matt knew he wanted to be a crime writer at the age of 13 when his father gave him Raymond Chandler's The Simple Art of Murder. Matt's books have won the Anthony, Seamus, Lefty, Ben Franklin Silver, and Ben Franklin Silver, Forward Reviews Book of the Year, and San Diego Book Awards. Blind Vigil, the seventh book in the Rick Cahill series, will be released December 1st, but you can pre-order from the Poison Pen. And Matt hosts the Crime Corner podcast. Um, and the author is on the air global radio network and lives in San Diego with his yellow lab Angus where he is writing his eighth crime novel. Okay, Michael Conley, you may have heard of him. He is the best selling, he's the best selling author of 30 novels and one work of nonfiction with over 74 million copies of his books sold worldwide and translated into 40 foreign languages. He is one of the most successful authors working today. A former newspaper reporter who worked the crime beat and oh my volume is lower okay let me um if you're hearing everything i say twice okay see in here all right hopefully hopefully it will get better um and now that's a former newspaper reporter who worked the crime beat at the los angeles times and the fort lauderdale sun sentinel conley has won numerous awards for his journalism and his fiction his very first novel, The Black Echo, won the prestigious Mystery Writers of America Edgar Award for Best First Novel in 92. In 2002, Clint Eastwood directed and starred in the movie adaptation of Conley's novel Bloodwork. In March 2011, the movie adaptation of his number one best-selling novel, The Lincoln Lawyer, hit theaters worldwide, starring Matthew McConaughey as Mick Mickey Holler. And his most recent number one New York Times best-selling Sellers include Dark Sacred Night, The Late Show, Two Kinds of Truth, The Wrong Side of Goodbye, The Crossing, The Burning Room, the list goes on. His most recent book, Fair Warning, which is the third novel in the Jack McAvoy thriller series, was released in May, and a new Lincoln lawyer novel, The Law of Innocence, is out in November. Um, uh, I am very close to my mic, I think. <laughs> so hopefully uh, we can turn it up. And... Just to let you know, we're gonna be playing the recording and we are gonna have all the questions. Michael and Matt and Naomi are gonna be on to answer your questions live. But right after the session, the session will just close and we're gonna move into our integration session. Um, and so enjoy, feel free to post your questions here, but again, we're not gonna be answering them live. We're gonna be taking the questions at the end of the panel. All right, bear with me while I switch to the recorded, the recorded video. I'm going to mute for a moment, so I'll just... Okay. Uh, Michael, the last time um, we spoke through the ethers was the beginning of June, and it was right after the first protest regarding um, um, the murder of um, George Floyd. And we also had an earthquake at the same time. I don't know if you remember that. So it's very California. Yeah, right. <laughs> very appropriate for a California discussion. Now that book event was regarding fair warning, um, your book featuring a journalist, Jake Lassiter. But I was surprised when you said you were actually excited by the challenge of writing a Bosch book um, in light of this, um, this call for like beyond police reform, like even defunding the police. So I wanted to check in with you. It's been about three months. Like how has your thinking or your writing evolved regarding that particular project? Well, I think I've been lucky this year because it was a year by prior planning that I wasn't gonna write about Bosch. I wrote the, um, the journalist book, and then I have a book coming out in November. It's about uh, Mickey Haller, the defense attorney. So I have, I kind of have a year off from Bosch, and I think that's why I was excited because I won't start writing a Bosch book till probably December, and hopefully we'll see the impact of this. Um, we'll see the change if there's going to be any change. But I also am kind of a born pessimist, and um, 
you know, I was a journalist during the Rodney King era in Los Angeles, and there was the Christopher Commission, and there's all these things that really added up to very little observable change in the way this town was policed. I mean, they always say we're going to go back to community policing or we're going to build up community policing, and that is so general, you, you know, it's not even clear what that means. Um, so I would like to write about Harry Bosch in a changed police environment. I still am in this stage where I'm waiting to see if that will actually happen. Um, one, one reason why is that um, I've been writing about Bosch for almost 30 years, so any kind of change that I can incorporate into my storytelling is great. Um, any kind of challenge to him, because um, you're always trying, as you guys all know, I mean, you're always trying to avoid the same old, same old. So if there's some new rules or, you know, the, the extreme would be that Bosch drives around with a therapist or something like that, that that would be um, interesting to me. And, of course, Bosch is not even in the police department anymore, but he's connected to it. And I more often than not write about Renee Ballard, who is in the police department. So I think... Whatever happens, if it happens, and sorry it takes so long, I think will um, really come out in uh, the books I write about her. Do you think, you know, as a best-selling writer, so you have the attention of a lot of people, do you feel any sort of responsibility to, like, I mean, in fiction, where I like entertaining people, right, um, to kind of address, like, these public outcries uh, regarding the police? What are your thoughts about that? Um, I do, because from the beginning, I've tried, I've always said, accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. I want to try to be realistic about the procedure, the politics, everything about um, trying to solve murders in um, the city of Los Angeles. So, you know, I can't say that for 25 years and then ignore this. It, ha it has to be incorporated. And I think um, if you're, you know, at the end of the day, I'm trying to... Uh, I often get accused of my books being a love letter to L.A. Um, I don't really feel that way. I mean, I'm not intentionally trying to write a love letter to L.A. I am trying to capture L.A. as accurately as I can. And so what has happened in the last few months is so big and so uh, and affecting so many people that I, I'd be, it'd be a betrayal to myself, a betrayal to uh, my work in the last 25 years, betrayal to my fans if I did not find a way of accurately um, reflecting this in some way in my books. And what about people who are like writing police procedurals? Maybe this is like their first one. Do you have any advice to give to them? Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of like what I just said. It depends on what you're going to do. I mean, there's, there's very successful and great storytelling that has that is a step removed from from um, reality in, in, you know, people who are constantly writing about uh, their character's own age and so forth. Um, that's all, those are choices you make when you're starting out and that's fine. Whatever you choose, fine. You got to go with what works for you and what your instincts tell you is going to work. But if you happen to be going down a path that I chose to go down, because I came to this world from being a newspaper reporter um, I said, I'm going to do this the way I'm going to be as accurate as I can. Um, you know, I'm, I'm first a slave to drama, but accuracy is very close behind that. And so if that's the road you're going to choose and you have to get into this and you have to try to, you know, um, you know, it really comes down to a character. Try to find a character that's in the middle of this, has some kind of connection to it or, or the events have forced something upon them. And then you get into telling your story. Um, you know, you, it's, it's very hard not to be, um, to tell people how to think. Uh, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, that's the, it's, it's hard to, um, to forget that. Um, you, you, you can't tell people what, what to think. You gotta be very subtle. Um, you know, if you're going to do mystery of a message, you gotta really finesse it, um, or else you turn a lot of people off. So it may be like the public may be in the mood for a character like yours, Matt, Rick Cahill, you know, the disgraced ex-police detective and private investigator out to get him at every turn. So how did you decide to create such a character in the first place? 
And also, um, I think I heard you say that a family member is involved in law enforcement, but how yeah. did you go about your research? And um, have you received any blowback from your sources in characterizing the police in the way you have? Um, well, I wanted to write about a, uh, a, a damaged person. So, you know, I write what I, I write what I know. I wrote about me, but um, obviously fictionally. But regarding the police, my brother-in-law, uh, Gene Wolf Chief, was a police officer in LA for 33 years. His son, Justin, is, uh, gosh, it's probably been 15 or 16 years he's been a cop there now. So um, I, I see police from a more um, personal uh, one. Of course, Michael has friends in the police force. I see police uh, on, on a different uh, different basis, a more personal basis. I know what good people my Gene and my, um, my nephew are, but I'm writing a private detective series, you, there has to be a reason for the PI to get involved in the story. So thus, uh, I mean, because they don't really solve murders. They might find somebody occasionally, but so there has to be a reason for them to, be, to, them to get involved. So my guy was always going to be bumping up against the police. He is a retired cop. He was arrested for his wife's murder, although never, um, never went to trial. So for him to get involved in a case and the, there had, the police have to have done something wrong, or overlook something. And they don't like him to begin with because his father was a, a supposed bad cop, made the, made the force look bad. And then he's got his own baggage. So for me, I don't think things are going to change. Uh, there's already a, a animosity between Rick and the police, although I try to write them as fairly as possible. Um, you know, I actually made I didn't have Rick. Uh, I wrote about Rick dealing with La Jolla Police Department, which is fictional. Right. Because I didn't want him. I didn't want him to go up against a real police force um, to make them look bad necessarily. Because I wanted something to be insular, where there's no citizen oversight and there's more ability for corruption. Um, but even then, um, I, I tried to write um, cops, even cops that are crooked, with um, their own um, sense of doing what they think's right in terms of maybe um, falsifying evidence in a murder or something like that. So for me, it's the, it's built in. I don't think it's going to change. I, I'm dealing with I don't, I don't. My world is much smaller than Michael's or a lot of other uh, mystery writers. And that I'm dealing with this one guy trying to sort of redeem himself through life. So it's uh, very it's very inward as opposed to looking outward so much. But I, I try to ha I make things realistic. If if it if it made sense for me to have Rick deal with something regarding police reform, I'd certainly write it and find the best way in. And have, has your relatives given you feedback on the way you've characterized the police? I'm not sure my brother-in-law reads me. Um, <laughs> everybody else in my family does. Um, I'm not, uh, but no, he helped me the first book. I got some stuff from him, but I, I actually got stuff from, uh, you both know David Putnam, um, who's a retired San Bernardino um, sheriff's deputy. Got a lot from him and I got from a, a now deceased homicide detective in San Diego um, information there. But um no, I mean, you know, they're they're all gone. I'm, I'm really, I could not tell you whether that my gene is read any of my books or not. <laughs> that happens. That, my family yeah. members, the same thing. I guess a follow up with Michael. I mean, it's related. You you have a close relationship with the LAPD, uh, at least in the past, and um, you and you probably you know had those kind of close relationships as a crime reporter. So how do you balance those friendships with the tug of the story, especially if the story's taking you in dark places? Well, I'm like, man, I'm not sure anyone reads uh, my books, you know, the ones that help me, because if you did this for a living, I really got a question why you'd want to read some amateur's effort to capture your life. And so, um, you know, I get, I get accused of having a great relationship with the LAPD, but I actually don't know too many people in the LAPD anymore. I haven't been a reporter in 25 years. I've had a you know a few uh, homicide detectives help me, but um, all but one of them has been retired for a while. And so, um, you know, I, I don't even write worrying about what they would think, um, you know, because you got to write what you want to write. I think what's, what Matt's doing is, is where we're going. It's, it kind of harkens back to, um, or, you know, Raymond Chandler and Ross McDonald's where the private eye had a very jaundiced view of the police because the police could not be trusted. And, and that gave rise to these great private eye novels. And I think with what's going on in the public right now with police, you know, we just had another 
uh, you know, questionable shooting in Wisconsin a couple nights ago. This is going to keep happening, and and I think writers like me have to look at it and say, do I want to keep writing about a guy who carries a badge and a gun and and represents the state? Because you know it's very clear the the tide is turning, and the public is very suspicious of of people like this. And it and it might be better to have the ex cop or someone who is never a cop who's who's looking in this window with um a lot of distrust and and trying to you know uh you know we're all writing about truth seekers and this is a truth seeker that's coming from the outside did you want to say anything in response matt to that no i think it's a good i think it's a good point um it's just a matter of of subject matter and where you want to go um i mean in in michael's books there's always uh police what I, which i love there's always uh police politics and uh i can't remember which story it was but harry actually throws a guy through a plate glass his lieutenant through a plate glass window and uh so um you know i'll explore what what makes rick um puts him in the most internal stress and where that next book will be i'm not sure yeah i mean matt you do things to rick cahill that God allows Satan to do to, to Job in the book of, in the, the Bible. I mean, uh, you do what some writing instructors recommend, like put your character through the ringer. And now I know your next uh, Rick Cahill book's coming out on December 1st, Blind Vigil. And right. he's been shot through his, he's blind, right? His eyesight. Right. And um, so that is like incredible that you made that choice. And it kind of reminds me, well, to my childhood of Little House on the Prairie when the older sister Mary became blind. And it wasn't a temporary thing. So what's gonna happen? Is this a permanent thing that Rick's gonna have to deal with? I cannot say. Okay, why did you I decide? Well, I, I, I was, when I was writing it, I thought you are such an idiot. Why didn't you just <laughs> like, in between this book and the last book and this book, have him cleared up, you know, have his vision come back somehow. Because when I was, it was the most difficult book to write because um, you know I'm not blind and I had to try to figure things out. I talked to a couple of people who have vision impaired, um, and I really, but whatever I write, what I always try to take. Uh, I, I, my whole life, I've been I've basically taken the easy way out. But when it comes to writing, for some reason, I don't. So I figure, well, I can't I can't do that. I have to. It has because of what happened at the end of the last book wouldn't have as much meaning if Rick's site is back when this book started so that's why i did that but you mentioned little house in the prairie um there's a point where rick's talking to a, a an idaho and he's talking to a private investigator this older guy of course rick's 41 in this book i gotta think about that when i'm writing because i'm 61. this 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 old cantankerous pi is calling he, he's calling rick longstreet the whole time going i don't care what you say longstreet and rick was going what is he talking about i don't know who's longstreet you know, <laughs> people that are younger than us may not remember but um yeah, I, I, I uh, it was difficult. Um, maybe not a great choice, but um, rewarding at the end, I think. But um, yeah, I was definitely cursing myself, thinking, "What an idiot to try to do this." I think it's great because we talk about diversity. You know that our sleuths have to have diversity. We naturally think of race or ethnicity or gender, but disabilities is like a big issue and. It's a situation that many of us, we might be healthy now, but especially eyesight, you know, as we age, you know, that's going to be an issue. So I, I think actually it's a great thing to be wrestling with and something that many of us will, you know, have to deal with. Um, we have a few questions from um, the uh, convention goers and organizers. One is Roseanne Haynes, and she, writes she wants to know michael um what do you what do you how are you going to depict um investigators in terms of the pandemic are they going to be wearing face masks Ooh. all the suspects and witnesses wearing face masks and especially since we don't know what the world will be um it seems like describing the characters seems like it has to change if the work is contemporary how are you approaching that well, I haven't had to do it yet, but yes, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to write, start writing a book in December. I know what the case is. Um, it's going to be a Renee Ballard story. So she's an active cop and, you know, I'm going to 
I don't know what we'll be doing in December. It's going to actually be set in January of 2021. And, you know, I'm going to be out there like a reporter. And however they're doing their jobs in with masks or whatever, um, that's, you know, do two cops, they'll ride around in the car together. I don't know. Um, but I'll do my research and then I'll, I'll reflect on that. Um, I just finished a book, come out in November, and I... I wrote it about early days, right before the lockdown, because it's a courtroom drama, and I wanted to get, uh, I wanted, I needed a courtroom, and it's got <laughs> closed down. So I, 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 it's, it's, you know, and I, I'm pretty accurate in reflecting what was going on up at that point, you know, in terms of, um, you know, um, no masks yet, but growing anxiety, people getting sick, things like that. Um, so it's like a, it's set, you know, basically the book ends February 27th. And, uh, you know, I think I reflect what was going on up until February 27th. And with my next book, I'm going to reflect what's going on in, in the upcoming month of January. How, how about you, Matt, with any future books? Have you thought about it? Oh. Uh, I, I thought about it. Um, I'm probably not going to address it because I can afford not to. Um, I... Um, one thing I think it helped is that I got I was a little more productive that, during those months than I than I had been maybe the, the past year, and it really for, for the like I said the insular kind of messed up guy right I mean the whole um, lockdown thing really kind of maybe aided that sense of uh, paranoia um, which my guy deals with sometimes, but uh, I thought about it and I've talked to other writers about uh, um, and some are definitely going to address the the mask and all that and 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 the whole bit but some aren't um, I mean. It could be we're doing this for the next five years and I'll look like a complete idiot if I didn't address it because everybody's living the, their life that way. But uh, I, hopefully within a year, this will, will this will pass and we won't be wearing masks and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I think it's fine not to address it. I just have I'm stuck with how I've always right. written. Every book I've written, you know, 30 plus books is set in the year they're published. And so I feel like you know, if I'd be the idiot if I suddenly created this alternate universe where this was not an issue, it would just it, it would just be contradictory to everything I've already done. So that's why I feel like I'm compelled to uh, address right. it. I think what's difficult is the scope of what's happening. Um, yeah. People are liking it to the Great Depression or World War II. And like for me, like I'm writing a historical set in 1944, and of course it's very much related to World War II, but it's like, how can you even write something set in that period of time and not even acknowledge the war, right? Right. So I think that's gonna be something that all write, writers of mystery will have, have to grasp, just right. because of the scope of what we're going through. But anyway. Um, Naomi, another, Naomi, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. This, this is your first historical, right? Yes. What's, is, is that a compl is the research so much different for you having to get so much more you know does that take a lot more of your time than the other books you've written well luckily that's what I, I also am a social historian and I've written oh. like nonfiction books so I'm pulling a lot and I love history so I'm just pulling a lot of that yeah so um, Kate Herbert had another question but I the way I want to form this is okay let's say Matt is plan hoping to write a uh, a streaming series based on Rick Cahill. So, Michael, what advice would you give yeah. him? <laughs> um, I'm taking notes. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. This was. This is also. What advantages and disadvantages do you see in the field of novel writing versus screenwriting? Do you prefer one to another? So, just whatever you have to. Some advice you have to say to Matt, as well as just how those two forms are different for you. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm always going to be a uh, book writer first. Uh, you just can't, if it's, you know, it's great work if you can get it to be able to, uh, you know, like with this lockdown, you know, that, that was my life for 20 years, just working at home. And it's beautiful. I, you know, the TV show came up pretty late in my career. So it was a good diversion. Um, and it's fun collaboration with other writers you know if they're good writers which is what i ended up getting on um, the T boss show so i have no complaint complaints about that but to me it's it's always been like a fun diversion and at the end of the day i got to go back and and write my books 
Um, you know, I, as far as advice, I don't know. I don't know what advice I have. It is different kind of writing, you know. It's quite different, you know, when you take out that big component of internal thought, which doesn't go into scripts. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, so I, I love that part of writing books. And so that's the one part about script writing that I mean, it bothers me is not really the right way to say it, but it's, it's, unco- it's what's uncomfortable about script writing for me. Um, and so therefore, I just think I'm, I'm like an old dog that's just not going to be turned away from, you know, what I've been doing for a long time. What about the what about the component of being in, in the writer's room? I assume that's what you, you did to some degree where, you know, before you're solitary and now you're dealing with other people's point of view, especially of a character that you've been writing for 25 years at the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always I think it was um, I don't know who it was, but lots of writers have talked about the separation of books. And, and some people are so close to their books, they hate to see anything I am I'm completely not like that. I've been writing about Harry Bosch since the early 90s. And so when we get into the writing room, things have to change. And I, I've actually enjoyed the idea of really rethinking some of this stuff and uh, expanding the storytelling to other characters. And the books, Bosch is like on every page, but in a show, he can't be. Um, it's just impossible, you know, to do that to an actor and, and you know, the construction of a show. So, th- so things have to change. And if you can't accept that, then, you know, say, I'll go back and write my books and you guys do the TV show. I, I accept it. And, and it's been some of the, the fun of it. Uh, I came to writing novels from being a newspaper reporter, which is, you know, a lot of people, a lot of writers in the room, a lot of um, pranks, a lot of fun times, all that kind of stuff. And then I lost that. I went away from it for a lot of years into the solitary writing world. And so going back to a, a, a writing room that has six or seven very qualified writers and is sitting around a table and joking and bringing in lunch and all that, it's, it's been a fantastically fun diversion. Uh, but it is a diversion. At the end of the day, it's a diversion. It's not what I do. Um, I, you know, I write books. Um, Matt, how about to new writers? What advice would you give a new writer? And how about uh, advice for writers who have several books out there? Well, for new writers, I'd say um, write. Don't wait for the perfect time. I waited probably 30 years or not 30 years, but maybe 20 years. Um, There is no perfect time. You have to have a day job when you write, um, at least for a long time. Uh, I would say take some classes if you can learn how the do's and don'ts before you stop, you know, making your own rule, before you start making your own rules. And you're going to need some outside um, eyes and it can't be someone who loves you. They can like you, but they can't love you. And it helps if they maybe read your genre or if they're readers at least. And I've been in a writer's group. I just started another one and got another one after being in the same one for 17 years, maybe. So I would suggest a writer's group and um, it doesn't have to be your genre. It has to be people that are good writers. Gar Anthony Haywood once told me that um, you never want to be the best writer in your writer's group and you never want to be the worst. I never really knew where I stood in my group, but um, um, because you need, especially when you're writing in first person, like I I am, when you first start writing, and I started writing 19 years ago, it took me 10 years to get my uh, book published, first book published. Um, You know, you figure out this is my story. Who could possibly, I don't need any outside help. This is my story, especially writing in first person. And you, you know, I knew nothing uh, because it, this, the story's in your head probably 24 hours a day. And so you're always constantly working on it. So especially when you're uh, writing crime fiction where you have to give clues, you know what happened. I mean, you may not know the whole story, but you know who killed who or what have you. And so you're having to lay clues, but you don't want to make them too obvious. And so it helps so much for some, uh, because you think you're in your head, you're going, well, I know what happens and I'm going to say this. And you definitely need outside eyes saying, Letting you know that you may not be writing the story you think you're writing, and first drafts suck. That's what I'll tell. It. That's what I'll tell uh, wannabe writers that your first draft, draft especially your first, it sucks. Um, live with it. Move on. Don't make the mistake I did when I I was working for a um, sports licensing company, and uh, I told people I was writing a book like an idiot, and so <laughs> so I've written the, I've written the first draft. And uh, people go, hey, can I read your book? And I go, yeah. So I print. I go to Kinko's. What was Kinko's? And I print out, you know, and I get them bound, and I hand these, I hand these freaking 
books out to people, too many. And uh, they said, eh, this is great. So I, I probably, every time my book comes out now, people are still living in San Diego. They'll see in the Union Tribune that Matt's next book's coming out. And they'll say, I read that guy. He's horrible. <laughs> it was the first draft like 10 years before I ever get published. So don't do that. Don't let anybody read it except for your writer's group. Yeah, that's true. You also <laughs> got to um, get the look, right, Matt? Uh, white beard, uh, glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I copied the best. You, you, you start with that. <laughs> I know. I, I went my own way with more more of a rectangular glass look, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I was saying, I'm moderating the panel with M&M. <laughs> yeah. Two M's here. It's rare uh, that you get two two men this attractive in the same uh, true, podcast. You're lucky. Good thing this is virtual, yeah. So Denise Gainley had this uh, question, and I think it's more for Michael. If you write about a highly polarized subject, how do you prepare yourself for the public's response mm -hmm. and criticism, not just bad reviews? Um, well, you, you definitely get that in this era of um, you know um, social media. Um, I, I mean, I don't know uh, about preparing yourself. It's it, you make choices when you're writing to either take a side or try to show both sides. Um, even when you try to show both sides, you'll you'll get um, you know people who only pick up on the one that they disagree with. Um, <laughs> You know, you just got to keep your head down. I mean, you know, it's it's a balance. I mean, obviously, especially if you're starting out, you don't want to lose readers. At some point, you can reach a point where you don't care if you lose readers. Um, I, I don't know. It's 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 hard to do. I, I still remember years ago. Uh, this would have been like 2000. It was right after. It was I put something in one of my books about the Patriot Act. And I went to a book signing and, and someone came up and they didn't have a book and said, I used to love your books until I realized your politics. And I didn't even know I had put politics into my book. Um, you know, I made some kind of comment on the origin of the Patriot Act, how it came to be. It was accurate reporting and I didn't think it took a side, but um, but there you go. So, you know, if you're going to worry about that, you're going to just like be, you know, wringing your hands. So I, I just think you just got to follow your instincts and tell the story you want to tell. And if it's, um, if it goes across some of that stuff, you're going to, you're going to hear from people, but you can always ignore them. Actually, uh, I don't remember the title of the book, but I remember the book and you didn't really take a point of view. So um, actually it was really interesting information and made me take a different look about how law enforcement could suddenly, um, Put you behind bars without due process but let me let me address that i i don't have i, I don't have enough i don't have a big enough audience for to to, to uh, first of all to lose anybody but for anybody to care what i write but when i was writing the last book um the one that came, uh, lost tomorrow's which came out last year i like i said i write a really insular guy and and there's it's a it's a series and there's carryover i try to make each book uh standalone ish there is some carryover and my character sort of devolved as things have gone as opposed to uh, evolve in some ways. He's gotten darker with each book. And by the time I wrote, this book was important because it was Lost Tomorrows was because it, you were, this, this mystery about Rick's wife was finally being addressed. And um, I was really, it was the darkest book I'd written at the time. And I, the point I said, this I'm writing this book for the people that have read me all along, wherever where they started, I'm finishing that story for them. And I, I thought I was really gonna get panned um, is people really wouldn't understand the character that well. Maybe some of the bad choices he makes. And um, luckily, I got good reviews. Although I'm getting I'm getting hit a little bit on on Goodreads. But I think you just have to, <clears throat> in a much smaller frame than Michael's, of course, you have to be true to, to what the story you want to write and just exactly. not worry about it. Yeah. I I think well, Michael and I have both been journalists, so I think that was a good training ground. You know, you get thick skin. I know if you know. If, both sides are getting mad at me, like I've done a good job. Mm -hmm. So I think um, to elicit some kind of response, I mean, you don't want to just poke people to poke people, but right. if you're writing something that's important to you and it, it invokes some kind of response from people, sometimes negative, uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because there'll be enough people that will like what you wrote too. Right. And um, in this era, I think being lukewarm is like the worst year. Lost you. You're not going to get any. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I just said you can't be lukewarm in this era. You know, I think right. you have to stand for something. There's, I just want to. Okay, I have. Thing. Yeah. I'm sorry. So you guys both are both have a um, a journalistic background. You asked me before advice to um, want to be writers, and I I was in sales for a lot of years. So that's a great background if you want to try to get published because you learn how to deal with rejection because there's a lot of rejection in the <laughs> publishing business, even when you you know you get somewhere. Well, there's some some rejection in being a journalist too. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, with sales, you're dealing with people, so that's important. I have a few fast questions for both of you. Um, okay, so how many unpublished or half finished books do you have? Either M or, or M. You have two. I have two. Yep. Uh, I don't have any, but the my first book was rewritten about seven times. So. Michael, do you think the two will ever see the light of day? No, they were, um, you know, um, they, they didn't deserve to be part of it. I didn't, even, I didn't even try. I never sent them out, but they were just part of the process, learning process. Um, I, I thought the second one was way better than the first, so that was, like, the good thing about it. it kept me going, so the third one got published. So, Michael, I once went to a book signing uh, where you, in San Diego. I think it might have been Mysterious Galaxy, and you said that you'd written 400 pages uh for in a manuscript i imagine that uh, it was due at some point and you said you put it in a drawer and started writing something else did that ever become a book that 400 pager part of it did yeah um I, i've twice um written a lot of pages and then um something happened where i put it aside i, I wrote one about uh it was, it was about a kid who took a gun to school and then the Sandy Hook thing happened and I oh, wow. this is not the right time. Right. So that's in a drawer somewhere. Um, and I've never gone back to that one at all. But the, the big one where I um, put, um, I'd probably exaggerate, it's probably more like 280 pages and I said it was four. It's enough. But um, I put that aside and then I went back and cannibalized that. Um, so, so it wasn't a uh, complete waste of time. Um, describe your writing space. Cluttered. Um, it, it, I, it, like, I like Matt's writing space because he's got my book behind his head. <laughs> Just where I write. <laughs> yeah, I I write. My own, no. <laughs> That's his salesmanship right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I Michael, mean, I have a desk. I don't. I don't really write at a desk. I. I I have a nice, I usually write on a couch with a laptop on my lap, um, but I have a desk for stuff like this and and business and so forth. But um, I don't know. I, I, I move around my house. I have different spots in my house where I know I have the the groove and I and I just find a groove and, and write for a while. Yeah, during the pandemic, I'm finding that I'm lying down a lot in writing. Like... <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Perfect. Um, what would you say is your most interesting writing quirk? Quirk? Um, I'll let Matt handle that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Quirk. <laughs> <laughs> I interviewed Matthew Quirk the other day. Anyway, um, I don't really have one. I, I have. Um, I try to have it as quiet as possible, which isn't always um, isn't always possible. But if uh, if there's noise, I'll put on uh, a Grover Washington album. I wish I could remember which one it is. It's not, and it's not even all instrumental. There is there are some uh, vocals, but and I almost every book I've listened to that at, por at some portion where I, I if it's not quiet, I need something else where I'm not concentrating on what people are saying. And at um, I think I told a story on Facebook one time. Uh, for one, at one point, I had a guy moving behind me who was a whistler. And he, uh, he didn't, it wasn't like show tunes or anything. It was just this weird, obnoxious, very high pitched whistling. And uh, I remember putting on Facebook that uh, not a good idea to uh, be a whistler next to door to a guy who thinks up how to kill people and get away with it all night. But anyway, I don't have any quirks, but I, I do have, to, if it's not pretty quiet, I like to have some music going in the background. I probably, um, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of shed all quirks and, superstitions and you know try to be able to write wherever um i remember i used to like be really um 
overly concerned with time mm -hmm. to, to the point that I would put like a little band aid over the, um, the, the clock on my laptop so I couldn't see what time it was and, and do stupid things like that. I just, um, I just stopped doing all that stuff. Anyway, I just put a band aid. What's your quirk? I just put a band aid over the, over the picture, uh, over the, the light. Just in case, because sometimes in the morning, I'll after I get out of the shower, I, I'll just be riding in my towel, and nobody wants to see anything like that going on. Oh, so you never know if people are spying on you. So that's where the yeah. bending goes for There's me. There's that paranoia. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, I think, what about you? You got I, quirks? I think the quirk is I don't need for my environment to be a certain way. Um, Good for you. And I think some of that is from being a journalist, especially being right. a journalist of a certain era where we would have to write, like if we were to cover something that happened in a courtroom, we would have to write it by hand and then call it in, call the story in by telephone. So you just, you know, I can write on a napkin, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. So I think that's one of the advantages of being, a, of, of learning to write as a journalist. That's great. You don't get too precious, you know, you're not lighting the candle. <laughs> <laughs> or, right. or any of that kind of stuff. And um, last of all, what is your writing kryptonite? <laughs> What's that mean? You mean something I don't that know. will stop you from writing? Yeah, I, I mean, these are questions from, yeah, the, the organizers. So, but uh, yeah, uh, however you want to um, interpret the question. Like for me, I need sleep. I, you know... Um. I, or I can't think, um, and I, I luckily do not have problems with in, insomnia. So, lucky you. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't really understand the question. I, I'll tell you the part I hate the most about writing is uh, copy editing. Like you get the oh, really? copy edited thing back, and they say we need this back in six days or seven days. I'll wait to the fifth day because I just can't stand going through a book and okaying commas and all that stuff. Um, it, I just have a mental thing about it. I, I, I just like by that time, by the time you get a copy of the manuscript back, as you guys know, you're on to the next thing anyway. Right. And the last thing you want to do is spend time on that story because you've left it behind and you're on to the next one. I go with that. I hate that too. Um, well, I think this is, we'll start to wrap it up. Uh, tell us again about your um, books that are coming up and anything else you'd like, like to mention at this time. Um, Matt, you want to go? Uh, yeah, thanks. My next book is, you talked a little bit about it, uh, Blind Vigil, and it's Rick's uh, next book after he is shot in the face and goes blind. Um, I do have a little podcast, too, that Naomi's been on called um, Crime Corner that I have uh, every couple weeks. Um, but I'm writing book eight right now. And right now I'm doing the slash and burn revision, which I love. I love cutting words that I shouldn't have put in the first place. Let me ask you this. Have you ever considered writing a non-Rick Cahill book? Yeah, I'm going to start after uh, book eight. I'm going to write something different. I'm not sure what it is yet, but um, yeah, we'll see and what happens. You don't know if it's series or standalone? Well, point. I don't know. I don't know yet. The idea I have is probably not for a series, but um, it's going to be difficult for me because I've been in the guy's head for 18 years. So Yeah, true. We'll see what How happens. About, tell us about your books that are coming out, Michael. Uh, the one in November is called The Law of Innocence. It's um, uh, Mickey Haller, the Lincoln lawyer guy. And uh, he gets accused of murder, so he's defending himself, you know, defying that adage about a lawyer defends himself has a client for that's a fool or whatever that is um and then i'm you know in my head just putting together the next one that's going to be uh renee ballard yeah um you know going back to something matt said about don't, don't hand out your first drafts um I, I don't know how many drafts you do but when um do yours get shorter like you're just talking about whacking, whacking stuff like right. that. I'm just wondering. I mean, mine might get considerably shorter. Uh, like this one I just finished. It, my first draft was 110,000 words, and 
I turned it turned it in finally at probably about three drafts at a hundred and one thousand. Oh, you mean so, did the did the final draft get shorter? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I did find so, that my first drafts are better now than they used to be, but they're still pretty bad. So they take a lot of work. I got a question for you, Michael. Um, Murder book. Are you gonna do any more of that podcast? Oh, yeah. You got plenty of free time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a second season coming out um, October 5th. Oh, cool. Good. Loved it. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's another it's another single case, um, deep dive into everything that happened in this one case. Although it was a serial killer, so it's a bigger case oh. than, than a single murder. But um, just an interesting uh, uh, investigation and what happened afterwards. And... Uh, yeah, just uh, it's going to be ten episodes. I just finished episode eight yesterday, so oh, cool. uh, it'll be good to go on October fifth. Do you do that in your home? The podcast? Yeah, I had a um, in my garage. I had a storage room. I mean, the first season, I kept having to rent a sound stage, not stage, but you know, there's a lot of in LA. You know, mm-hmm. there's all these all these actors that do like animation stuff. A lot of them just go into these little cubby hole type recording things. And I was using them. And the big part was traffic from driving to them. It would take me a lot of time. And I'm trying to do this with as little time as possible. So for the second season, I took this um, storage room I have in my garage and cut it in half and half is storage and half I made a, a you know, a amateur sound stage with padding mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. like that got a good uh, microphone stuff like that so that's made this a lot easier hey, i want to say one other thing what you asked about uh, beginning writers i would say that read michael especially if you write police procedurals because i know every michael book i have i have dog-eared pages where like i didn't know that all this all this uh, things for police procedural and and the mickey howler books um, I don't necessarily use them, but I'm, I'm, as I'm reading it at the time, I go, God, I never knew that. So all my all my Michael Connolly books have dog ears on them. Mm. Someday I'm going to go back and look at them. Hopefully it's, uh, it's the true stuff and not made up. <laughs> <laughs> you fooled me one way or the other. That's, yeah, that's the real art. That make it seem like this thing is accurate when it's not. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, in this era, it's amazing how much is available, how much research you can do online, too. Sitting on your butt, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's... Um, I think I was doing some research on the evidence room of the LAPD and they had done a, um, a YouTube session, you know, just doing a tour of the evidence wow. room. So, you know, some of that may be dated, but yeah, it's incredible what sort of things are online these days. Absolutely. Yeah. So anything else you, you guys would like to say to each other or, um, I mean, uh, any last questions? No, what, well, I, I owe Michael a big thank you for um, blurring one of my books, but he already knows that, so that's all. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you so much for uh, being with us, and uh, I look forward to reading your books. And um, yeah, and that's all. <laughs>